Thank you, Jeff, for praying for us, with us. And uh, that was a blessing to have received that testimony. Anybody else have anything to share? A blessing? Yes. That's a blessing. Good. Thank you. So continue to pray for Roy. He is here. Anyone else? I mean, is anyone else here? But does anybody have something else you'd like to share? Marla? Uh, we need to remember to pray for John Lewis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so pray for John Lewis. He has uh, special needs, and uh, we'll be running by there this afternoon to check on him. There's a deacon's meeting uh, this afternoon. Appreciate prayer. I have to present the mission's budget because my boss is in Myanmar. <laughs> so uh, pray for Dave as he begins flying tomorrow, arrives in Atlanta Tuesday morning. So pray for the, him, all the connections and travel, luggage, uh, his piece of luggage did arrive the Friday after he did on a, on a Saturday before. So he was a week without his luggage and um, that's just what happens. So. Good to see each one of you, and uh, we're going to be sharing this morning on one word that uh, has multiple implications for our lives. So I trust you got a handout. Um, if you did not, they are at the back. So, um, and there are words that we use interchangeably. I think in our English language, the word jealousy. Jealousy is the fear of losing something or someone um, when you, that you feel belongs to you. And uh, that often occurs in a, uh, when there are three people or more involved. Uh, greed. Greed is desiring more than you have. A dad was walking with his kids down the sidewalk and those two boys were just hollering, just screaming. And a neighbor stopped and said, uh, what's going on? And he said, my children's problem is everyone's problem. One son has some candy and the other one wants what he has. And that's a good definition of greed, isn't it? So envy, envy is a little bit different. So that's, what, different that's what we're going to talk about. Wanting something that is not yours, but an added ingredient is resenting the person who has it. So a dog was running alongside of the little pond with a bone, nice big bone in his mouth. And he happened to walk over to the edge of the pond and looked and he saw another dog with a big bone in its mouth and he barked at it. And of course, you know the rest of the story. He not only lost his bone, but also that dog disappeared with the splash that his bone made as it fell into the pond. So envy sometimes does not end very well, does it? It's kind of like poison for the soul and kind of imprisons the mind. I'd like you to turn as we start into Proverbs 27. That's not where we're going to stay. But uh, if you would turn to Proverbs 27, and these are some maxim maxims that we can share. Uh, we will just pick up at the end after reading the first six verses, and I will ask for someone to help me with that, if you will. So Proverbs 27, verses 1 through 6, if somebody could read that for me. <clears throat> Proverbs 27, 1 through 6. Okay, Terry? It says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may be in force. Let another, let another man praise thee, and not thy own mouth. The stranger, and not thy own lips. The stone is heavy, and the sand is weighted, it's weighted. But a fool's wrath is 
heavier than them both. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The full soul loveth and honeycomb, but to the hungry every soul, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Okay, thank you. And so, as we look at wisdom here, um, so you don't pat yourself on the back. Uh, wrath is cruel, anger outrageous. They're like a knife causing destruction, a match starting a fire, and then envy. Envy is sort of like a pressure cooker. Um, and if you open it, then you're, you'll be in trouble. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. In the Old Testament, we read of Absalom. Absalom was a son of King David. He murdered his brother Amnon because he had violated Absalom's sister. Absalom then, after being in exile with his grandfather um, due to marriage by David of his third wife who was a foreigner, and so he went to be with Grandpa for a while till things cooled down. He did come back. Uh, Joab was instrumental in that. It's kind of an interesting story. You should read it sometime. But um, Joab ends up um, fighting a war against Absalom, who had risen up against um, risen up against David, his father. And Joab is actually the one who instrumentally kills the king's son. It's an amazing thing, the, the tension between this man, General Joab, and King David. Because of what he did, we read in 2 Samuel, and we will be going to 2 Samuel if you'd like to go ahead and turn there. We're a little bit ahead of where we are going to camp a little bit today, but in this chapter 20, a man rose up after, now this is after Absalom was, was um, killed, the rebellion was supposedly put down, and yet this man, who is a son of the devil, verse, according to verse 20, uh, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, he said, we have no part with David, and so Israel then when we see the seeds of division, Israel then goes after, after this man. And David, who had already put down Joab and put Amasa in as the general, he asks Amasa then to go gather the troops in Judah. They've got to go to war. They've got to stop this rebellion. Three days later, he hasn't shown back up. That's a problem, uh, even in those times. <laughs> And so uh, he sends out then in chapter 20, he sends out all of his mighty men. So he sends out the special forces, verse 7, with Joab. And they're, they're going after this rebellious person, Sheba. While they're going, we find that Joab comes up on General Amasa. And as he comes up, I don't know exactly how it happened, but it does say, and it does sound like it was premeditated, Joab had a sword at his side. He also had a cloak. And so as he came up, I need somebody with a beard. Would you come up here, Mike? <laughs> Yours isn't quite long enough for my illustration, but I, I promise take, Barbara we will not be too violent. I didn't here. take my medication, so be careful. All right. <laughs> Whoa. And so as Joab comes up, 
they're in the they're in the field, they're in, they're in battle. His sword falls out of his holster, his sheath. He just happens to pick it up, and then he says, "Hello, my brother," and he grabs him by the beard. It may have evidently was what you did back then. He's going to give him a kiss, but what does he do over here? Because Amasa is not paying attention to what's going on. Joab then kills the dude. I'm not going to do that. I always thought it was amazing that a man could not pay attention if another man was going to kiss him. Well, yeah. <laughs> Actually, if you will look in the Bible and find out, just do a search on the word kiss. I know. It was a lot of kisses. kisses on the either side thing. Yeah, and, and it was men to men. So, uh, yeah, just uh, thankful we're not like the Russians who it's mouth to mouth. That's right. Yeah. And as I think I mentioned one time, that's why a former mission director said, that's why those dudes drink vodka. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Joab, what, what a man. What, what was his problem? He kissed he called him my brother, and then he just assassinates him. Interesting that we don't find repercussions going on there. And again, I told you it's a very, uh, you, don't, you don't have to watch uh, mystery stories. Just read your Bible. There's a lot there. And Joab uh, is one of those characters. So he kisses a man and then just murders him. Did that happen in the New Testament? The three synoptic Gospels talk about a kiss, a very important kiss. Why did Judas use that symbol? To kiss our Lord, and Jesus said, Judas, when Jesus said someone's name, <laughs> it had to have an impact. Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, what were his motivations? There were many. I look at one of them when Mary came in and put the ointment and he was upset about it. And by the way, that ointment was what people smelled when Jesus was on the way to the cross. That was potent stuff that was still there on his body. And yet we find perhaps envy, perhaps not receiving the kingdom like he thought should happen. But what, for whatever reason, envy is an issue I think we have to face. When we look at the 17 different fruits of the flesh in Galatians 5, they're manifest or they're shown, it says, and in the middle of that list, of things that we would agree with, yeah, the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, etc. But verse 21 begins with envyings, and we wouldn't probably put it in the list. <laughs> so envying is a fruit of the Spirit, and that passage then ends, so those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It shouldn't be a part of our giftedness. <laughs> it's not, of course, by the Spirit. So what is envy? Envy's looking at what we don't have and poisons what we have. Someone said, envy is like the yeast that swells the fortune of others. Envy shoots at another but injures itself. So people who fall into envy compare themselves to others. They exaggerate the blessings of others and minimize their own blessings. In other words, envious people keep scores. Somebody said, and I had to read this two or three times, you are not a failure until you cannot support the success of others. So when we stop supporting the success of others, then we can be in trouble. Proverbs says in chapter 331, Envy thou not the oppressor. Chapter 24, 1, be thou not envious against even, even evil men. So we have to be careful, don't we? We look around our nation. <laughs> we get worried. 
uh, we wonder why different people are doing different things. And as we turn back to chapter 18 of 2 Samuel, again, the fascinating story that the Holy Spirit gives us between King Saul and David. So back to 1 Samuel, excuse me, 1 Samuel 18, back to the prior book, chapter 18. We find that there's a conflict between a king and a shepherd, a shepherd who's a musician. And so in chapter 18, this is after Goliath has been killed. God gave David the wisdom and the ability to do that. Jonathan, in the beginning of chapter 18, his soul is knit with David's. They become true brothers. <laughs> There's a covenant made in verse 3. Amazing. And then symbols of that covenant are given to David by the king's son. And David went out, verse 5, whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And so what did Saul do? He saw that giftedness and set him over the men of war. He was accepted in the sight of all the people in the sight of Saul's servants. So he was promoted. Perhaps he was head of the bodyguard. He also went out to forage among the Philistines. And so David becomes a leader. The problem is that people also notice that. And whether it was exactly when he came back after defeating uh, the Philistine, Goliath, or on subsequent trips, perhaps also, when the women would celebrate the victories that David was leading, what did they say? Saul has killed his? Thousands. And David? Now, sure, that was, it was a song. It was uh, not literal, but how did that sound to the king? Remember, he's, he's bigger than anyone else. What's that? It was a threat. It was a threat. And so he re David receives as a hero, and in verse 8, Saul was, what was his first reaction? He was angry, displeased him, and he also felt threatened the last part of verse 8, didn't he? What more does he need but the throne? I'm in jeopardy here the first king of Israel. And so, verse 9, what, did, what happened to Saul's heart? He started keeping an eye on David. With good intention? <laughs> no, with bad intention. So a jealous heart will plan evil and it will deliver death if given the opportunity. That's the insidious thing of, of this, this word envy what it can do to your heart. And so we find David playing his harp, which calmed the king. I don't know if you all listen to music, but I do, and um, I appreciate soft music. We have gotten into a habit with my sweetheart of listening to that as we go to bed, set the, set the timer. The only problem was we were driving one day and the music came on and we both started yawning and we're driving, you know, so anyway, that's... So Saul has calmed down, but what's going on in his heart? Verse 11, Saul casts the javelin, and they're probably pretty close to each other. How he missed was because God saved David and because David was probably suspecting something. When you see a man's hand, he's playing. He's not following any notes, uh, as far as I know, written notes. He's keeping an eye on the king and his mood. And he's reaching over there. He's got the javelin. Uh, you, you know, doesn't take a lot of figuring out what's going to happen next. Two times he escaped him. Avoided out of his presence twice. So what's another reaction of Saul? Verse 12. What do you see there? He was afraid. Fear. 
And why was he fearful? Who had left him? The Lord. The Lord's presence. We understand the Holy Spirit came on in a special way upon God's people in the Old Testament for specific tasks. In this case, the Spirit of the Lord rested on David and was no longer on Saul. And so, envy became a huge problem in the heart of Saul. Again in verse 15, as he noticed David's activities, he was afraid of him. You look at verse 29. He's also afraid of him in verse 29. So this fear is provoked in the heart because of the contrast of David's wise ways. Saul actually removed him from his presence, made him captain over a thousand. And I'm not a military man, but I kind of looked this up and it said an army lieutenant colonel is over a battalion, which um, I guess that's what he was. And he sent him out. So David became wise. He was a good, good administrator of the resources given to him. But he was a threat, a threat to King Saul. So what does envy do? Envy actually looks at the achievements of others as a threat, taking it personally. The two men were business rivals. They had shops on either side of the street in a marketplace. They were so strongly against each other that it didn't even give them joy anymore just to have a good day of sales. They had to do better than the guy across the street. They had spies in each business who let them know how things were going and they kept tabs on how many people went into the shop and how many people walked out with produce. <clears throat> one night, one of them had a dream and he was promised one wish with a condition. So here it is. I will give you anything you ask in one condition. What you ask for, you will receive. But your competitor will instantly receive double. If you want to be rich, you'll be wealthy, but your rival will have double your wealth. If you want to live long and be healthy, your neighbor across the street will live twice as long and be twice as fit. So the man begins thinking, boy, I'd love to be wealthy, I'd love to be rich, and I'd love to be healthy. But he calculated. Guess what he asked for? He said, please, Remove the sight in one of my eyes. Can you imagine? And it's just a story. But the, the, the depth of somebody's envy <laughs> to go to that point, point, and yet it can be an illustration of what can happen in someone's heart. King Saul looked at David's accomplishments as a threat to his authority. And as we look at our friends co-workers, uh, whatever area that we're in life, do we look at them with distrust or with love? Now, I'm, I want to ask you, did, did David actually pose a threat to Saul and his kingdom? We, we know the scripture. David actually had opportunity on two occasions to kill him. Uh, but he held back his men, he said, because this is God's anointed. And so envy often is a figment of our imagination. It's not even real, <laughs> but we dream it up because it comes from our deceitful hearts. Saul becomes worried. He begins to distrust. Instead of rejoicing in David's victories, which were good for him, the king, he began to look for some way to eliminate this guy. How to get rid of David. So MB causes you to look at the achievements of others as a threat. Secondly, it makes you suspicious. And you look for some way to defeat them. 
how can I crush this guy? Well, it was kind of handed to him on a platter. Chapter 18, verse 20. Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Why did it please him? Because this guy was going to become his son-in-law? No, because he saw beyond that. I will give him to her that she may be a snare. I'm going to make a trap for this guy. We'll get rid of him this way. And so he, as you know, he told his servants to go secretly to talk with David. And that's often what envy does. It's not up front. It makes a hypocrite out of somebody. And so Saul apparently publicly is behind David and yet behind his back. He wants to see him dead. So envy that is unidentified, unconfessed, unrepentant will lead to bitterness. Bitterness leads to conflict and can lead then to violence. It's like rust will eventually destroy iron. Envy can eat like the desire, eat in our souls until it destroys us. And so Saul says, go talk to David, butter him up, tell him the king wants you to be his son-in-law. You know David's response? No, not me. It's, um, I'm not that good. I'm just a poor boy from the country, a shepherd. But he puts out a test for him. It's interesting. He sends him into battle and says, if you'll come back with proof of having killed a hundred Philistines, by the way, David did that a little bit later with Uriah, didn't he? Sent him into the battle and condemned him to death. But this time David actually survived and came back with double what he was requested. And Saul gave him his daughter. Verse 28, Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David and Saul became David's enemy continually. Wow. <laughs> so what is envy like? Envy's like if you play basketball, at least some of us used to, or mine was soccer. But it's like a teammate scores a three-point shot that was so crucial in the game. You congratulate him. But the next time down the floor, he's wide open for a layup, and you don't pass the ball to him. That's envy, working itself out. What about ladies, if you compliment another lady on a lovely dress, and then later you criticize her for her extravagance? But you probably have never done that. MB looks at a neighbor's house that's being remodeled, or a brand new car that he purchased, and then comments to another neighbor, wonder where they get all the dough from. Envy. <laughs> that can become a part of our daily lives. Proverbs 14.30 says, A sound heart is the life of flesh, but envy the rottenness of bones. Now, in scriptures, we find a lot of envying going on. I'm going to start you off with one. Satan, Lucifer. Who did he envy? God. <laughs> he wanted to be above what he was. And he wanted to be like God. Diving into the book of Genesis, who can pick up from there? How about some people who envied each other? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Result? Yeah. One dead. And he, they were brothers. Didn't start out well in the family, did it? <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, Joseph. So... Benjamin may be not born quite yet, so 10 against 1. What did they try to do at all? Envy led them to try to kill him. I mean, they were going to kill him. But the Lord stepped in there. Um, and that lasted all of his life. <laughs> Even after they supposedly made, made, made amends. Again, brothers. 
Who else? Jacob and Esau. Brothers. Do we have any ladies? Any ladies can give samples of some ladies who had trouble? Leah and uh, Rachel. Yes. Leah and Rachel. <coughs> Sisters. Hannah. Yes. Hannah being persecuted. And again, um, bigamy, polygamy, not a great idea, right? How about David? He goes to battle. What do his older brothers say to him? What are you doing here? <laughs> and he was bringing them cheese and 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 goods you're from. from <laughs> you're you're here to spy on us. What what are you doing? We go to the New Testament, Luke 15. We call him the prodigal son, the older brother. How about the twelve? These men who Christ chose specifically and individually. How did they get along? <laughs> Was there any envy there? I'm telling you, 24 hours before the cross, these guys are jockeying for position. Amazing. Amazing. So are we any different? Perhaps not. And what happened later? Pilate knew after he declared him innocent over and over and over. He knew the leaders had given him up because of envy. There's our word. They envied him. So envy causes us to see the achievements of others as a threat. We suspect other people and it drives us to plot their defeat. And then envy will blind us to the blessings and achievements in our own life. The story is told in the fourth century, a legend, supposedly a man who lived as a hermit. He was a holy man in the north part of Africa. And so this story was told about him. That the demons tried to get him to sin. They were not successful. So finally they went to their chief. And he said to them, let me show you, I won't use any bad names, but let me show you, you need to see how a professional works. So Satan goes to this man in the desert, all by himself, and he whispers in his ear, your brother is now the new bishop of Alexandria. In an instant, the evil results were evident. His face contorted, his eyes narrowed. Envy had taken hold of this man. And so what does James say? If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. The wisdom that descendeth from above is earth, not from above, is earthly, sensual, devilish, but wherever there's envying and strife, there's confusion in every evil work. So, I'm telling you, this is a serious thing. Now, we all have situations that cause us to be prone to envy. Maybe somebody else's work ethic, maybe somebody else's intelligence, their physique, the way they look, and without really thinking about it, we're accusing our Creator of not making us more like them. Instead of gratefully accepting what God's given us, we covet what somebody else has. In our drive, many times to accumulate or acquire things is motivated because we really feel like we deserve more and better than our neighbor. Saul should have been David's biggest fan, but he felt threatened, and envy took the blessings that God could have given to Saul, and they were distorted. Somebody in the Middle Ages said, love rejoices in the successes of your neighbors, while envy weeps, and your life becomes bitter. And so lastly, what's the remedy? The remedy is, of course, to have a heart of love. 
And in 1 Corinthians 13, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity, or love, envieth not. Envieth not. A wise man once said, I must love God enough to be content, and I must love people enough not to envy them. So contentment to God, with God, and love for people. Again in Galatians 5 we read that if we live in the Spirit, let's walk in the Spirit. Let's not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So what are some action steps? Be honest. Focus on the Lord Jesus. Develop a lifestyle not just at Thanksgiving time, <laughs> a lifestyle of being thankful, a gratitude, worship. It was a blessing to be at a funeral yesterday. Funerals always move me. I know I will be up there one day and people will be doing what I did. Grieving, uh, thinking, memories, contacts. And then hearing, I felt like I got to know a family yesterday. Not just Dean, but his family, who I did not really know. But they shared from their hearts. That was a blessing. And I thought, wow, maybe one day I'll be up there and some of these things can be said for those that are still here. Count our blessings. Pray. This was an interesting one. Avoid activities that encourage comparison. Don't just go window shopping at the mall. I said amen to that, but the reason was <laughs> you're gonna see a lot of things you want and you probably can't buy. Interrupt feelings of envy. Avoid activities that encourage comparisons. So we remind ourselves what Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that we possess. Remind us, Lord, that we're your chosen children. Second Thessalonians 2.13, from the beginning of time, God chose you for salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. And then ask yourself, what is it that I envy in that person? And if it's a good quality, then try to emulate it. Don't just disparage what they have, but try to Admire it and seek for God to use you in some way, in a similar way. Immerse yourself in prayer and the Word. Be confident in Him. Love does not envy. It thinks no evil. And then develop your gifts. I appreciate what Pastor said today and he's going to continue next week. Looking at your spiritual gifts, what God has given you to use and to give back to the church. Memorize Scripture. Ask God to bring believers into your life so that you can encourage them in their relationship with God. An epitaph that I read some time ago and I actually had to look it up because it, it is a real one. It was from the Black Prince of Wales, son of King Edward III, who died at 45 on June 8, 1376. But this epitaph has been repeated on several tombstones throughout Europe and I think a few in the United States. And this is how it goes. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be, so be prepared to follow me. And I'm told that somebody scrawled on the bottom of that. And I heard this repeated from my mother's lips. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> so... Life is short. We can't waste our time envying others, but being thankful for what God has given us and rejoice when we see God using others in ministry in their field of ex expertise. Because if we were all the same, we'd just be one big eye, wouldn't we? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for encouraging us and even when it hurts, uh, we are sinful, I'm sinful. And uh, thank you, Lord, for teaching me 
I do thank you, Father, for what we have uh, enjoyed together as a class today. Rejoicing and weeping and looking ahead and looking back. And we do pray for the special needs that we have. Thank you for Robin. We uphold her again to you, Lord, as we do each day. Thank you, Father, for sustaining and giving grace that they could be here today. Pray for Pastor Miller, guide him, strengthen him. And we do thank you also for your presence with us. Thank you for helping us fight the fight against sin, that we can do so in your spirit, that we don't have to live in the flesh. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.